$50. Awesome. I'll put this in my bank account. Oh, yeah, I want this. I never realized that there was little 20s on the side right here. Oh my gosh, this is heavy. I don't know if you guys sealed it on really tight or I'm just weak. What is this? I don't like vegetables. Really? Five hour energy? I feel like I have too much energy already. I don't really want this gift. It is not better. It's a piece of dog food. And it's a box. Video game, I hope. Broccoli and carrots and uh, what's that called? Cauliflower. Yeah. Chocolate chip. What am I supposed to do with this? Wow, I got socks. Yay. Thank you. You can have the rest. Good morning. Well, welcome again to VFC. Thanks for being here on this beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, it's actually not that nice. It's so cold outside. Uh, but thankfully, it'll be like 95 on Christmas, so we're good. It's going to be great. Uh, this has nothing to do with my sermon. How many of you like, you're excited about a warm Christmas? How many, how many of you hate it? How many of you want it to be freezing? Man. The first group of people, I like you more. Uh, I hate I hate cold weather, like, especially now that I don't have any hair. It's like it's just an instant headache when that freezing cold hits my head. So it's it is what it is. But you cold people, you can at least enjoy today, I guess. Go outside and spend the day outside then, if you like it so much, with a t-shirt and shorts on. Good luck. Good luck. We started a sermon series called Unexpected Gifts last week. I talked about a Bible that my parents got me. It was very unexpected. And at that time in my life, I didn't, like, I didn't really appreciate it. But looking back, that unexpected gift became uh, one, of the, one of the greatest gifts I'd ever received. Uh, about two years ago on Christmas Eve, our Christmas Eve worship experiences, uh, we, we did, that year we did, I think, four in a row, now we, we just did uh, Christmas Eve. We didn't do uh, the 23rd. This year we're doing the 23rd and 24th. I want to encourage you, don't just come. I promise you need to come. It's going to be awesome. But bring somebody with you. It's like, I promise you, you're going to want to bring somebody with you the 23rd and the, and the, and the 24th. And so uh, a couple years ago, the 24th, we, we do our Christmas Eve worship experiences. And then like when I preach, I get hungry, right? And so I'm hungry. I want to go eat. But it's Christmas Eve. Everywhere is closed late at night except... Hibachi Super Buffet. Anybody been to, what y'all know about Hibachi Super Buffet? Come on, man. It ain't that good, but it is like, but when it's the only place open, it's awesome, right? So, uh, so we were on our way to Hibachi Super Buffet, and there was a, a family in the, in the church who I, I've known for maybe 15 years. I love them. They're dear people, precious people, in, in, incredibly kind people, and, and they had given me a, a box. kind of looked like a shoe box. And, and it, was, it, was, it was wrapped up, and so it gave me this Christmas gift, and there was, I read a nice, nice little card, you know, and so it was cool. So I'm driving in my car to Hibachi Super Buffet, and I'm just going to see how many times I can say that in my message today, uh, Hibachi Super Buffet. Uh, and so I'm, I'm impatient, just like kids are when it comes to gifts. I'm curious. And so I start opening this, this gift, and, and I, I get to the box, and I'm a very unfamiliar box, and so I'm like, this is kind of weird. And so I open the box, and it is a, it's, it's, a, it's a bottle of wine. And I don't drink. And they, they know I don't drink. And, and so I was like, man, this is, this is kind of This is kind of bizarre. And, and about that exact same time, my, my assistant, Megan, she called me. She said, have you opened your gift yet? And I said, I just, I just did. And, and she said, uh, well, they just, because they had given it to her to give to, give to me during, during church. She said, they just called me, and they're panicked. They gave you the wrong gift. <laughs> And so, like, I'm thinking, this is, this, is the, this is the greatest present of all time because I know them so well. I'm like, I'm going like, to get so much mileage out of this. And so, and so I start calling them because I want to give them a hard time. Neither one of them answer. They won't answer their phone. And they're talking to my assistant. Like, I'm like, I know you got your phone because you're talking to my assistant right now. Like, answer your phones, right? I'm texting them. They won't answer. And so she comes and gets it and finally gets me. They actually got me really nice boots. And so uh, I still wear the boots a lot, and I love the boots, and they're amazing boots. But I'm also thrilled that they gave me that wine first. So. I can hold that over their heads the rest of their lives. It's really, really fun for 
for me. Uh, last week we talked about the unexpected gift of less. And this week we want to talk about the unexpected gift of the unknown. Like all of us, I think, are familiar with the Christmas story. Even if you didn't grow up in church, if you don't know, like you, you don't follow Jesus, you're familiar. You've seen a nativity scene. You've seen a movie. You at least know something about this, this Christmas story. I think the challenge for a lot of us, maybe and especially for those of you that, that you did grow up in church and you have heard this story so many times and you, you've heard sermons about the, the Christmas story so many, many times, it becomes really difficult that a familiar story, like, like to look at it from a, a new perspective. So, so I want us kind of today, maybe if you could just kind of forget everything you know about the Christmas story and, and, and maybe just kind of think about it for the for the first time, maybe not knowing how it all ends, maybe not knowing how, how it plays out with Jesus, but just thinking through the unknown life that Mary and Joseph had to lead. Let's look at Luke chapter 1, verse 26. It says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary, the angel, went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? Which is a really good question. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I'm the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Think about that. Then the angel left. The angel just dropped so many bombs on Mary. Just right there. Like, like I know you're a virgin. You're going to give birth. Uh, he's going to be Jesus. He's going to be the savior of the, of, of, of the world. And Mary's like, all right, cool. Like, may it be, Lord. Like, like that's just like my personality. That's not me. That, I, I'm, I'm like, we need to go to dinner. Like, the angel, like, we need to go to dinner. I got a lot, like, like you're going to send me a detailed bullet point email. Like, I need to know exactly what to do, when to do it, how to do it. Like, you just told me I'm going to raise the Savior of humanity. I'm not going to screw this up, right? And I would clearly screw it up. But, like, I need more information. No one's going to believe this crazy story. How is Joseph going to believe? How are we going to explain this? There's so many unknowns for Mary and Joseph. Then in Luke chapter 2, we see them traveling 80 miles to, to Bethlehem. Now, at this point, Mary is nine months pregnant. She's traveling by donkey or, or mule 80 miles. That's like here to Ardmore on a donkey. Pregnant, nine months pregnant. They don't even know where Jesus is going to be born. There's no room in the inn. There's no Airbnb. They go to a stable. So many things that they just don't know. We see in Matthew chapter 2, after Jesus is born, verse 13, it said, When the angel, or when they had gone, sorry, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Okay. Not only are they going to raise the Savior of the world, now an angel appears to Joseph. He says, get your family up and go. The king is trying to kill your son. And he doesn't say, he, like, just go somewhere for a few months. Just go, like, tuck away uh, for the next year. He doesn't know. Joseph, at that point, he doesn't know. Is it going to be two weeks, two years, 20 years? I don't even know. They just simply listened and obeyed. And they didn't hear, they didn't hear anything for three years. And again, the angel didn't, didn't say, hang tight for three years and then I'm going to come back. They didn't know, but after three years, King Herod dies and they return to Nazareth. And in Matthew chapter 2, verse 19, it says, After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up and take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. 
So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. Mary and Joseph lived their lives in the unknown as they raised Jesus. Like my goal in my life is to eliminate variables. Like everything, anything that I lead, I want to eliminate as many variables. I feel like if I want to be successful at anything in life, let's control the controllables, eliminate the variables, and then attack what we know. That's how, like a formula to be successful. Like they didn't have any controllables. They, and everything in their life was a variable. The, the unknown for, for me is really, really scary. I don't like the unknown. I, I, we've been on a couple cruises. Like the first thing I check, are we going by the Bermuda Triangle? I don't want to go there. You, I laugh. I'm not even kidding. Like I don't want, like I don't want to fly over. I don't care. Like I know, like people say, what is? Like, this is not a thing. It's not. Somebody disappeared there at some point. So I don't want to have anything to do with it. Like I don't, I don't, I don't like it. I like to swim in the ocean, but as soon as seaweed touches my leg, I scream. I think it's a shark. Like I just, I don't know what all is in there, right? So I don't like the unknown. The unknown is scary. Think about COVID the last couple of years now, almost two years of this stuff. There's so many unknowns, so much fear because we know so little. For some of you, you're in a season where you're not even certain if you're going to be able to afford your, your house payment. There's just an unknown. There's unknowns with your job. Am I going to have my job next year? My company's downsizing. Am I going to be laid off next? You know, with what my kids are doing right now, I just, I just, there's an unknown. How, how, how are my kids going to turn out in life? For some of you, you're, you, you, you're thinking, uh, am I ever going to find that, that special someone that God put in my life to spend my, my life with? There's, there's an unknown, and, and you begin to get fearful of the unknown. Am I going to be successful at, at, at whatever I'm doing? And maybe some of you, you just took this massive risk in your life, and, and there's this unknown. How is it going to play out? And, and there's fear that begins to, to creep in, because oftentimes the unknown causes anxiety and, and, and fear. Or sometimes, if you're like me, what you do in the unknown is you try to make it happen on yourself, and you get ahead of God, and it's in a disaster. What if instead of it, the unknown causing fear, causing anxiety, or us trying to do something on our own, what if in the unknown we simply learn how to trust the Lord? When we live in the unknown, we're, we're challenged to trust that God knows best. Think about how much Mary and Joseph could have questioned God in this, in this process, the, the virgin birth, the fugitive on the run for your life, the, the humiliation that Joseph is going to encounter. The, there's so many unknowns. It would have been easy to say, God, I, I don't understand what you're doing, and frankly, I'm not okay with it. Yeah. God, you have just asked us to raise the Savior of the world. God, this is the most important God's less human that will ever walk on the planet. And, and you can't even give me a little more detail? Because it's too much. Because it's, too, it's too, too much. I don't know enough. But even though Mary and Joseph didn't understand it, they simply trusted the Lord. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. All, all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, meaning you don't need to figure it out yourself. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. They were just living out this passage. I just know if I can trust in the Lord. I don't worry about what I know. I don't worry about the variables. I worry about trusting in the Lord, and he will make my path straight. they got to learn to trust the Father. About a month ago, my, my son was at school, and he goes to school here. They were playing football. I believe they were playing, like, in the main, like, on the concrete in the, uh, the whatever, the entryway here, the this south entrance. And, uh, and, and my son, he, he got, my, my mom actually got him some new shoes for his birthday a few months ago, and they're, they're very white. And so he decided it would be a good idea to take his shoes off to play football on the, on the concrete. And I've told him somewhere between seven and 900 times not 
to take your shoes off, especially at school, especially when you're at, at recess, for a lot of reasons, fr- frankly. But don't, like, just keep, just keep your shoes on, dude. Like, and, and so, like, if he goes outside, just put your shoes on, right? He goes outside. Anytime he goes outside our house, he takes his shoes off. He gets a splinter on his foot, and he's like, oh, that my foot hurts. I said, I know, because I told you, keep your shoes on, right? So, like, it's not, a, it's not a new concept. But because he got these new white shoes, he had to keep them clean. And so he took his shoes off, and he's playing football. Then all of a sudden, he's trying to look over his head to catch a pass, and then he runs right into a curb. And so, and so when I see him, he's like, he's, like, limping. He said, Dad, I think I broke my toe. My first response is, you didn't break your toe. And then he took his sock off, and I said, I think you broke your toe and and I was I was extremely compassionate dude I'm so sorry man that that stinks and and then I said how did it happen he said I was playing football and I was like that I mean looks that looks weird like how did it happen he said I took my shoes off and I ran into a curb and I went from compassion to like really irritable really fast I said that's your fault then I don't feel bad for you anymore I'm serious I don't I don't I mean, if he was, like, bleeding out or something, I would have felt bad still. But he, he, I know he went fine. It's broken toe. It's fine. And so I was like, how many times did I tell you not to take your shoes off? So that's on you. I said, now you have to do this, this. You can't do this and this. And this is going to happen. This is going to happen. You're walking on crutches. It's your fault. I told you. See, he, he has to understand I'm not the, like, our Heavenly Father is infinite wisdom. I'm not the smartest dude in the world, but I know better than him because I've been there before. He got to learn how to listen to his his father. And it's not that I don't want him to have a good time. I'm actually trying to protect him. And I speak to him because I actually want what is best for his future, even if it doesn't make sense to his little 12-year-old brain right now. And when the Lord speaks to us, it is actually because he wants what is best for our future. And frankly, our little brains cannot comprehend all that God wants to do in us and through us. So we have to learn that our father knows best. If he created the stars in the sky and the world that he can hold in the palm of his hands and every single one of us and he knows everything about our past he knows everything that's happening today he knows exactly what is going to happen in our future it's time that we start trusting in the lord so we trust he knows better than us several years ago i made a massive mistake eight, eight years ago i made a, i made a huge mistake i said yes to something i shouldn't have said yes to you know hurting a lot of people to be, be honest with you Confusing to a lot more people. And several months into saying yes to something, a mentor, a friend of mine, an older guy that had been in my life a long time, he, he looked at me and I was kind of having an emotional breakdown. He said, so why are you doing this? I said, this is the right thing to do. Now, honestly, I thought it was the right thing to do. I thought I was doing something that was going to help the most people, not hurt people. And I can say that utmost integrity. Like, I really thought it was the right thing. And he said, you, you hate this. And I'm crying. I'm like, I hate it. He said, did you pray about it? And like, uh, you know, I'm a pastor. Of course I. No, I didn't pray about it. I didn't pray about it. I just, I just thought I was doing the, the right thing. And because I trusted my own knowledge and my own understanding, it ended up hurting a lot of people. And I learned quickly. I, my role is simply pray and obey. When I try to figure things out, I screw it up. When I think I know best, I screw it up. When I can just pray and obey, that's when God does the miraculous. I've learned I don't need to think and I don't need to feel. I just need to pray and obey because my Father knows best. And I know my Father has a plan for my life. He has a plan for your life. And it's a good plan. And He'll get you there as long as you pray and obey. There was a, a really successful guy named John Cavanaugh that went to visit Mother Teresa in the Calcutta, India, what they call the house of the dying. And he spent several weeks there, and at the end of his, his time there, he asked Mother Teresa if she would pray over him, which I think if you spend some time with Mother Teresa, that's a fantastic idea, right? You just, I would just ask her to pray over me too. And she said, what can I pray with you about? He said, just pray that in my life I have clarity. And she said, no, I, I won't pray that. And he said, well, why won't you pray that? He said, I feel like you've had clarity at everything you do in your life. She said, I've never had clarity in my life, actually, and I will not pray that you have clarity in your life. She said, clarity is actually the last thing that you're clinging to. What I will pray is that you learn to trust in the Lord. Touche, Mother Teresa, right? (laughs) 
I just wonder if there's so many of us, myself included, that we're just clinging to clarity. And the Lord's saying, just trust me. You, you, you don't need to know. Just, just, just trust me. I got you. I'm going to work out. You don't need clarity. You just need trust. See, we, we trust that God knows best, and then we trust in the next step. Like, like I said, Mary and Joseph, they didn't have a, a three-year plan or a five-year plan. They, they didn't know how long they were going to be in hiding. They didn't know how long they were going to live in each place. They didn't know when Jesus was going to start a ministry. They didn't know when Jesus was going to die. They didn't know how, how he was going to die. They, 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 they didn't know all this. They were just faithful to the next step. doesn't mean you're lazy. doesn't mean you're just sitting around waiting and saying, oh, God has It doesn't mean that. It means you're consistently talking to the Lord and quickly obeying him. When we started nine years ago, like we just, that's all we, that's all we, that's all we did. And frankly, that's all we've been doing. Some people say, like, how did you guys do it? I don't know. Like, I don't know how, how we, 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 we've done all this. We just pray and we obey. That's it. We prayed and we, we, we started nine years ago at Barry and Boyd and we prayed and, and we knew that's where the Lord had us and there's a lot of obstacles and we prayed and we obeyed and, and God began to do great things. This first part of this building, Hobby Lobby gave to us. We just prayed and we obeyed. And then we came in here and that was our next step. And then, and then our next step was building on. We built on this like five times. And then we went to Newcastle, and then we went to Chickasha, and then now we're going to, to Shawnee. And people ask all the time, where's your next campus going to be? I don't know. You know what my strategy is? Pray and obey. So wherever God tells us, that's where it's going to be. I don't know. I don't. Maybe it's down the street. Maybe it's in Africa. Both those are actual options right now. I'm not sure, but uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. I just want to pray and obey. When I try to do it the other way, I screw it up. I'm an idiot by myself. Like, I'm pretty brilliant if I just pray and obey because it's not, it's not me. It's just I'm just listening to God and doing what he says. When I try to do it on my own, I'm a moron. And I'm, like, if you want a real smart pastor, like, thanks for visiting. Like, I ain't it. <laughs> Whoa. No, you don't have to say amen there. That's where you laugh, not say amen. That's... You know this, most of your relationship with Jesus just comes from simply taking the next step. It's the next step of obedience. A lot of you say, I have this, I have this dream, I'm going to open this orphanage up in, in, in Haiti, and I got these big dreams and these big plans, and God says, but your next step is actually uh, to volunteer with, with foster care here in your own community. You're like, oh, I mean, I don't, I don't know, I don't, I don't know, I don't know all about that. We want, the, we want the big long-term dream. We don't want to take our next step. Next step, I mean, it's... It's not always as, always as fun. What, what is your next step? As a follower of Christ, what's your next step? See, a, a lot of us end up slipping into the casual Christian lifestyle. A lot of us end up getting stuck. A lot of us end up lukewarm, stagnant. Why? Because we're not moving. Why? We're not moving anywhere. God's calling us to take our next step, and we're just staying here. And we think, why do I become stagnant? Because you're not going to be stagnant as long as you're praying and obeying and taking your next step. What's your, what's your next step of o- obedience? For some of you, it's a, it's a small group. For some of you, it's giving. For some of you, it's telling people about Jesus, sharing your faith. For some of you, it's prayer. For some of you, it's fasting. I don't know what your next step is, but I I don't know how you can continue growing in God if you can't at first identify the next step that God has for you. Like, what? you're just chilling. And and God has given, and and some of it, you're waiting on an audible voice when he already laid it all out in Scripture. Like, some of you, like, he already laid it all out. Like, there's a lot of next steps, and you're just, and you're just chilling, and you can't figure out what's my next step. Well, open up God's Word. He'll tell you. There's a lot of next steps in there. Psalms chapter 37, verse 23 says, The Lord makes firm the steps of one who delight in him. Though he may stumble, he will not fall, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. Just take the next step, and he's got you. Without taking your next step, it's impossible to end up in the destination that he created you to live in. Your destiny, it's over there, but you got to take the next step to get there. You're not going to just magically teleport into your purpose. you got to take a step to get there. When we live in the unknown, this is the last thing. I don't have much time. I want to challenge you with this. you got to also trust you're a part of a bigger plan. Mary and Joseph, 
Their, their faith enabled them to trust God in the big picture. There's so many moving pieces, so many things that they, they do not understand. So much going on in the world around them. There's so much chaos. There's so much turmoil. They had to step back and say, I don't know a lot. I don't have clarity on a lot, but I do know that God sees the bigger plan, and I'm happy to play my part. In a world, I want you to hear my heart on this. I hope it makes sense. In a world where everybody wants to be a king, are you okay with being a pawn? And I'm not saying that God is playing a game with your life. I'm not, I'm not saying that. So I want you to hear, please hear, hear, my, hear my heart. Like we just want, like too much, we want glory, we want credit, we want, we want to be the star of a show. But can we resign ourselves to saying, in the grand scheme of God's plan, like I, I'm okay with being a pawn? Like I'm okay with playing my role that in the world's eyes is seemingly insignificant, but it's vital to what God's trying to do in this community or in my na- with my neighbors or with the world around with my family. I'm okay falling into this insignificant, seemingly insignificant role because I'm more concerned about the kingdom of heaven than I am about my kingdom here on earth. There's a, a precious family to, to Christy and I, Tim and, and Tammy McCutcheon. Tim was on our board for several years, and uh, Tammy, a lot of the murals and a lot of the art you see all over any of our campus, she, she has painted those, and they're, they're business people, uh, but before they were business people, they actually pastored a, a few churches, and they actually pastored here in Norman about, about 30 years ago. Last year, I was having a conversation with Tim, and he said he was pretty overwhelmed and, and, and grateful for what God was doing in this church, and he said, Adam, what, what God is doing in this church that's what we prayed for 30 years ago. He said we prayed and, and we believed and we had prayer meetings and they pastored a very small church in this community and with that very small church, they, they prayed and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed. And he said it's just cool to kind of see what, what, what God is doing. And I mean, it kind of hit me when he, when he said that. The success of, of this church probably has a lot less to do with the things that we see and a lot more to do with what happened 30 years ago. The hard work hasn't been happening for the last nine years. The hard work, the plowing of the ground and the planting of the seed, that happened when I was in the third grade. When these people were praying and believing and praying and believing and praying and believing. See, we all just get to see the harvest. As of right now, I think we're 45 people away from 2,000 people coming to know Jesus this year at Victory Family Church. We get to see, that's great, we get to see a harvest. We get to see this cool harvest. But, but make no mistake, that didn't, that's not about 2021, what God is doing. That's about what God started 30 years ago in prayer when nobody knew what was going to happen in the future. It's faithfulness. It's faithful to say, I'm going to play my role, whatever that role may be. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 says, I, it's, it's Paul saying this, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. Listen, we are nothing, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose. And they will each be rewarded according to their labor, for we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. There's a, a, a Chinese bamboo tree. You plant the seed and water it, cultivate it, take care of it. It doesn't grow an inch for five years. But you still got to take care of it for five years. You still got to water it, still got to keep weeds away from it. And then this, this particular bamboo tree, after five years of not an inch of growth, can grow up to two feet per day. So you think about five years of, of, of nothing. Then all of a sudden, In three days, this thing's taller than me. I know some of you think I'm like 6'2", but I'm not. <laughs> it's dumb. In a week, in a week, the thing's 14 feet tall. In a, in a month, it's way bigger than our, our church building. Imagine that. 
Was it about that week or was it about that month? No, it was about five years of cultivation. It was about five years. Are you okay with praying and believing and doing the work of the Lord and being patient and saying, God, I'm just going to be faithful. I'm not worried about the growth. I'm not worried about the success. I'm not, I'm not worried about the accolades. I'm not worried about it. God, I'm just going to be faithful. When you see little growth, be faithful. When you think, I'm doing everything that God has told me to do, just be, just be faithful. Trust that God is doing something to prepare you. People say, oh, over the last nine years, your church has exploded. I mean, kind of, but there was, there was 30 years of prayer. 30 years of cultivation, 30 years of, of watering. Remember when Moses led God's people out of captivity? I mean, think about how many great things Moses was a part of. Parting of the Red Sea, getting God's people out of 400 years of slavery, the burning bush, Ten Commandments. Dude's legit, right? I mean, uh, by all accounts, unbelievable. But if anybody should have been able to make it into the promised land, it should have been, it should have been Moses. But for 40 years of leading God's complaining, moaning, grumbling, whiny people, frustrating people, he never even steps foot into the promised land. Are you okay with being a part of a process and God says, you're just setting it up for the next generation? Are you okay with saying, God, I'm just going to play my role. I'm going to step back, and God, I understand there is a bigger picture. God, I understand. I may not understand what is happening in my life, what is happening around me. I may not understand on this side of heaven, but God, I know you're a good God. I know you're a faithful God. I know that you are for me. I know that you have a plan, and God, I know I am a part of a, a bigger picture. And Lord, do whatever you will with me because I trust you. I lean not on my own understanding. I trust you. Do you trust him? Like, do you really, really trust him? Can you step back and say, God, I trust that you know best. You're my father and you know best. And you love me. You want what's best for me more than I want what's best for me. And God, I pray that you would reveal not, not my future. God, reveal my next step. And some of you honestly just need to read God's word because it's already in there. God, show me my, my next step. God, help me understand. I'm, I'm just willing and obedient to do whatever you want me to do as a part of your big picture. To see people know you. Whatever it is, God, I'm willing. I want to be obedient. I just want to obey you. Can we be a people that just simply trust the Lord? Heavenly Father, let us trust you. We want to trust you, Lord, in everything that we are and everything that we do, God. We want to live a life of, of trust. With your heads about and eyes closed across this auditorium, some of you, as you're trying to figure out your, your next step, there's others of you that you haven't taken your first step in your relationship with Jesus. You don't follow Jesus. Maybe you said a prayer, but you, if you just be really honest with yourself, you're not following Jesus. You don't live for Jesus. You live for you. You're not trying to listen and obey. You're trying to do your thing. But today you would just be honest and you would say, I want to begin following the Lord. I want to, begin, I want to be forgiven of my sins and stop living for myself. But I do want to live for God because I know he sent his son to die on a cross and I know he rose again. And so today I trust my sins with Jesus that he'll remove them from my life. Forgive me. I trust my salvation. I trust my purpose, and I trust my eternity with Jesus. If that's you all over this room, and say, I want to put my trust in God. Will you just slip your hand up in this room all over the auditorium? Thanks, thanks. Amen. A few of you, amen. Thanks. Amen. You put your hands down. Everybody pray this prayer together with me. Heavenly Father. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the cross and the resurrection. Forgive me my sins. Help me to live for you, to follow you, to worship you every day of my life. I believe 
You're exactly who you say you are. In your name I pray. Amen. Hey, thanks so much for jumping on our YouTube page. My name is Adam. I'm the pastor here at Victory Family Church. This is my wife, Christy. Uh, I just want to say welcome to the family. We talk about family a lot here. Now you're a part of the family on YouTube. And so hopefully the content here will help you, challenge you, encourage you, and maybe make you laugh a little bit. So uh, subscribe. We'd love to have you. Uh, Have an awesome day.